let's do some Python hardware. All right. Um, so a little bit of reminder. I put this in the chat. Don't forget, Scott, tomorrow, 9 a.m. Central Time, Bluetooth app development with CircuitPython. Do check that out. We have a bunch of stuff. Uh, let's see how many are left. 90. OK. You guys are ticking down. Yep. Tick, 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 tick. Um, our secret Python on a hardware newsletter. We do this every single week. Um, some Pi 5 details, um, some Raspberry, uh, sorry, some Circuit Python uh, 8 uh, updates. Yeah, we're getting so, ready for 9 out Yeah, of which I was about to say 9. Um, yeah, numbers. Uh, well, we're doing the 8s while we prepare for yeah, 9. Yeah, so Circuit Python 9 is coming, but we have the 8 to 7 release. There's a couple more boards. Um, some really neat projects this week. Um, this MicroPython calculator is. Really cool. Um, we're going to start adding some of the Adafruit Playground. These are notes, guides that anyone can make. Um, we'll talk about that later on in the show, but we're going to have that in the newsletter since there's a lot of uh, Python-based ones. And then um, check out just the menagerie of uh, projects. Um, Hackaday, uh, site I found a million years ago, have nothing to do with now, but I like seeing things that that's why I started the site, is this is the type of stuff I wanted to see. Um, they have a Hackaday badge for Supercon, and uh, you can do MicroPython stuff. So. It's a cute looking badge. Yeah. I like the little joystick. Cool. You can the screen on it, and uh, I like seeing my logo. My logos. I like the combination of big like seeing it. buttons. I like yeah, seeing it. Nice. It still works. And it works great on a round display. Yeah. Um, so check out all the projects and more. However, um, this week, uh, what we're going to talk about is uh, there's a bunch of stuff going on in the world of Python. Yes. So we've got the virtual environment usage, and then um, on Playground, we also have um, the comparing the GIO yeah. stuff. Which, should I well, which one do you want me to talk about first? Um, I don't know. Do you want to just talk about like what the issue is, and then kind of like instead of um, being uh, jerks on GitHub or social media, we're just going to help solve it and do good documentation yeah. um that's our idea so um okay. what it is it's our idea it's our idea uh well we're also going to hang back so yeah. basically as of bookworm which is the latest release of the raspberry pi operating system which is also going to be the um it's going to be the operating system that's required for use with the raspberry pi 5 um they've changed debian has changed how they do python package installation um which you know everyone always makes fun of python packaging because they're using python as part of the operating system and utilities they don't want you to be able to mess up that install and so um instead of letting you just do sudo pip and install into like the root you know root or main um site packages folder they're kind of requiring every user to make a virtual environment that will then keep all your packages in like your home directory for example um, and this is technically correct. Like you technically should do that. It is the right thing to do. Um, it's not very punk. Uh, and we're kind of punk. And we're we're still kind of investigating, you know, even that's the right thing to do to have a virtual environment. Um, there's about a decade's worth of Raspberry Pi tutorials that don't. And don't talk about that. And nobody's gonna go and update all of them. Like we're happy to update all of the Adafruit guides. Um, but there's just no chance that every Instructable and every Hackster and every Element 14 and every blog post yeah. is going to be updated. A lot of people use PIP. Um, and what you're supposed to do is, is is set up your environment beforehand. So, you know, I think there's there's some discussion about it. Um, Raspberry Pi folks, you know, have some opinions, other people have opinions. Uh, we haven't yet decided what we're going to do um, because it's a big decision. We don't want to make a decision and then take it back. Uh, there's a couple of things. One, we could tell people, hey, just disable this inability and just like install pseudo pip anyways. We could have um, our Blinka script set automatically set up your virtual environment in your bash profile so it always gets configured when you start up. Um, we could update every tutorial to say, hey, you know, here's what your virtual environment should be and you'll just have to turn it on before you begin. Um, there's there's no there's no real right answer. Um, it's definitely going to be a bit of a mess. We kind of want to see what other folks want to do because each one has pros and cons. And honestly, I just can't make that decision right now. I'm just a little too tired uh, with the baby. So um, 
to that end, we have a guide that Carter wrote. Uh, I asked him to write it, and Carter's like, you know, Carter's one of our best guide writers for beginner topics about virtual environments and how it affects the Raspberry Pi in specific. There's lots of guides about virtual environments, but because you might be using sudo to do NeoPixel stuff um, in particular, uh, it's important to kind of know the intricacies of, of setting up this virtual environment. So this guide talks about that and specifically talks about how to do it with sudo and what doesn't work and what does. So um, the answer is no answer, but we at least have a guide that we can reference to. Uh, so thanks, Carter, for writing it. <laughs> yeah. So um, we'll see how things go. But, um, you know, generally speaking, um, maybe our community, which I think is pretty big, can kind of set a good example. Like stuff's going to come up and uh, the last few years, people are just rewarded for being um, terrible to one another. So I would just say, like, especially for open source maintainers, um, a lot of you know, a, a lot of people are demanding. There's mean people. They're like, do this now for me. Um, they're basically like, I want to speak to your manager and like treating us and others like customer service. Uh, it's the type of person that if you're at a restaurant and they're yelling at the wait staff, like no one likes that. Um, don't be that person. So um, I think we're just going to try to figure out what's the best thing we can do. So we started writing guides. That's what we always do. Like when something yeah, just exploring what, yeah, what, 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 what is we it? do to solve this, you know, because I was like, I don't know how it like this is even yeah. with 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 NeoPixels and sudo and, and how is that going to happen? Yeah. So so we have um, so we got that. And then um, did you want to uh, talk about this other um, this other stuff here? Or... Yes. Sorry. And then the t t on the other side, uh, you know, we want to make sure that Blinka. Um, so one of the really good decisions that we did make, you know, it's like I, some decisions I'm putting off and some decisions I made that were I'm glad I did. So having uh, Blinka as our interface library so that we can um, have the CircuitPython API available on CPython, the Raspberry Pi has been a really good idea because historically we a very, very long time ago before Blinka, we used RPI GPIO for all of our Raspberry Pi GPIO toggling, you know, um, and, and tweaking. And turns out that um, as with the Raspberry Pi 5, because of the new RP1 chip, GPIO zero, sorry, RPI.GPIO uh, no longer works. Um, and it's unclear if they're going to update it to work. And so um, because we happen to have been supporting Blinka on other single board Linux computers, and those were using libgpio-d, which is the new kernel module that is recommended for GPIO interfacing. Um, we already had support for libgpio-d in Blinka, and like Melissa was able to turn it on like fairly quickly, um, you know, in a day, not in like weeks. Um, and so Blinka has been updated to use libgpio-d. Um, one thing that I didn't notice a while ago was that GPIO-D was not as fast as memory mapping, which RPI GPIO does. Uh, memory mapping is always going to be the fastest, but it requires permissions and it's like kind of dangerous and you're like prodding memory and it's like you're kind of poking into somebody's brain. Uh, and so I asked Melissa, could you please um, check GPIO zero, which is kind of like the official Raspberry Pi GPIO interface library for Python and the GPIO-D Python bindings and compare them. Um, you can scroll down and uh, she did a great job uh, and keep going keep going keep going and even posted up um the sale uh outputs so basically it turns out that gpiod can go up to about like 550 uh kilohertz uh toggle speed um the up and down is going to be 280 so you double that to get the um the uh the toggle speed because there's two toggles per frequency and then um on libgpi sorry in gpio zero it's about 200 kilohertz so you're going to get like about three times speed with gpiod uh 600 kilohertz is pretty good actually um considering it's going through this like secondary chip 600 kilohertz it's not fast enough to do neopixels and but you wouldn't do that anyways you would use like the pio sub capability um but basically just you know documenting this and if other people because i knew some people would say hey why don't you use gpio zero and it's like I have documentation now uh, so what we're doing is uh, documenting. Yeah, so that's what we're doing while um, people are just uh, lobbing insults at each other about all this stuff. So um, that is our Python on hardware. Lots of stuff going on, as you can tell. Um, yeah. So just stay tuned to all of our documentation updates. Stop by the shows. We'll tell you, you know, what we're up to. Um, but that's our plan: is to just do great documentation, and great products, and. Uh, Oh, this is a bit of a rant. Yeah, well, whatever. Sorry, it's okay. Um, I will keep going. We send out this newsletter every single week, adafruitdaily.com. It's a completely separate website because we hate spam even more than you do. 
And um, you can sign up there. It has nothing to do with your Adafruit store account. You can subscribe, unsubscribe anytime. You don't even have to subscribe to the newsletter. You can look at a standalone page that's a permalink that doesn't have any tracking. Also, on it's WordPress. on GitHub. It's on GitHub. It's an RSS feed. Wow. I had someone saying that, like, uh, tracking. It's like we have every way for it to be the best privacy saving way. We have to use tools like MailChimp that send out things and there's links that you can't stop tracking. We have other ways to read the newsletter. My favorite is some people like, oh, what's so hard? Why can't you just send out a couple hundred thousand emails? I'm like, have you actually tried to send yeah. more than a thousand so, emails? It's really so hard. So that's why we jump through all these these hoops. And and like I said, if you want to, you don't ever need to even subscribe to the newsletter. You can just go to the page and uh, we've been de-Googleifying. Nothing against Google. Well, besides some other, I do have some. Google is just, um, but you can just go to Adafruit Daily and um, just, just you can just read it every single week. We have the link right here. You, yeah, it's cool. Okay, cool. Okay, it's great. Okay, anyways, um, that's news. Hour.